Vue 2 Max is something you can't really game the system with Vue 2 Max. You're really, you're either fit or you're not fit. Say yes, maybe you have a strong heart, but if your lungs are weak, um, if your you know mitochondria are impaired somehow, mm. your Vue 2 Max is gonna be low. So having right. a high Vue 2 Max really means that all of your systems are kind of operating on all cylinders. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, all of these studies are coming out showing, oh, it's very, very highly linked to, you know, uh, health span and lifespan. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Brady Holmer. Brady has a master's degree in human performance from the University of Florida. He's a science author, marathon runner, and he posts information online about exercise, performance, VO2 max, and nutrition. Brady, welcome to the show. Seam, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, I'm also excited to talk with you because uh, I was following you on Twitter. So you had some nice posts about exercise and VO2 max that were interesting. And I also noticed that you were following me. <laughs> so I was f figured out why not have a, like, a conversation and uh, we'll have some interesting things uh, to talk about. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's happened to me a lot where basically people I meet on Twitter or X then become either guests on my podcast or I go on their podcast. So it's a great place to, to meet people and exchange ideas. Mm. Yeah. So you're kind of new to this uh, online content creation, I guess, then? Um, a little bit, I think. I mean, I've been, you know, on po podcasting for a while. I've been on X for, for quite a while, I think. But just kind of in terms of interacting with, you know, science and health influencer, I get, influencers, I guess we can call them. Um, I mm. feel like I'm, I'm pretty new in that space, but um, it's been interesting over the past, you know, five to 10 years to see X evolve into like somewhere that uh, people can share information rather than just argue about stuff. But of course, a lot of that goes on as well, the arguing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I found your content on Twitter or X and uh, yeah, it was a very interesting specifically about things related to VO2 max and uh, cardio and endurance. And you've written a book about it as well, the Automax Essentials. So yeah, I'm uh, mostly interested and excited to talk about the Automax because it's one of those really trendy topics over the past few years in the longevity space that uh, it's considered like a very important biomarker for longevity. And obviously many people want to increase it and know how to uh, do that. So why don't we like maybe start with what is VO2 max and uh, what does it actually like measure or what does it uh, mean? Yeah, for sure. So VO2 max, um, it is, I would say, one of the most common or if not the most common measure of your cardio respiratory fitness. And what the actual number represents is the maximal rate of your body's oxygen consumption during exercise to exhaustion. So if you were to go into a laboratory and start running on a treadmill, and they increase the treadmill speed and maybe even the incline and you ran and ran and ran and walked until you couldn't walk anymore. Um, the point, your oxygen consumption at the point of exhaustion would be your VO2 max. And what it reflects is the integrated ability of your lungs. So your respiratory system, uh, your cardiovascular system, your skeletal muscles and your mitochondria to take in oxygen um, deliver that oxygen to your mitochondria and then turn or use that oxygen to produce energy or ATP. And I think, you know, we'll get into this probably, but I think that that is one of the reasons why it's so strongly linked to health span, longevity, lower rates of morbidity and mortality is because it's not just something like hand grip strength where, oh, you're, that means your grip strength is stronger, which is still you know, uh, associated with longevity, interestingly, but VO2 max is something you can't really game the system with VO2 max. You're really, you're either fit or you're not fit and say, yes, maybe you have a strong heart, but if your lungs are weak, um, if your, you know, mitochondria are impaired somehow, mm. your VO2 max is going to be low. So having right. a high VO2 max really means that all of your systems are kind of operating on all cylinders. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, all of these studies are coming out showing, oh, it's very, very highly linked to, you know, uh, health span and lifespan. Mm. Yeah, it's like a multi-organ biomarker kind of, whereas yeah, if you have high grip strength, then you could be like this overweight powerlifter <laughs> who is just very <laughs> super strong, but who has like, a, you know, mass, massive belly and uh, extra body fat. So yeah, I right. guess you can't have a high VH max and being like super overweight 
uh, at the same time. Yeah, correct. It would be it would be very hard to be in bad health and have a you know a VO two max in the high fifties to sixties to seventies. Like you very you very rarely see that, and so it it uh, correlates pretty well like that uh, with that. And like you said, if you could have somebody who was overweight who had metabolic syndrome, but yeah, maybe they can deadlift three hundred pounds. Uh, I don't think that that would predict their longevity as much as something like VO two max does. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. Is that the only way to know your VO2 max you do, the, like, the running test where you're going to near a failure? Uh, or is there like other, because like some of the clocks or these smartwatches... They assess your VO two max based on your like running speed or something like that. What do you think about that? Yeah, if, if you want a true test, so if you really want to know what a measure, what your VO two max actually measures at, you're going to have to do one of those maximal tests. Um, but you can certainly estimate it using, like you mentioned, um, you know, if you have a smartwatch or an Aura Ring, actually now does it, um, Apple Watch, Garmin, something like that. It will give you an estimate of your VO2 max. And as you mentioned, what those commonly do is just use um, a measure of your fitness. So it'll take, you know, your running speed and your heart rate at that running speed and different metrics like that. You know, it'll integrate your weight as well um, to estimate your VO2 max, and those can be accurate, but they're not always the best. Um, you know, I've seen them be off as much as anywhere from 5 to 10 mLs per kg per minute, which, you know, if you're really concerned about VO2 max and with the data that even 1 to 2 mLs per kg increases or decreases can actually, um, you know, affect health outcomes, then those estimates can be very, you know, important if they're wrong. So, they can you can estimate it with that. Um, other ways, though, that you can do it if you're not wanting to do a maximal exercise test, um, there are several submaximal tests that you can do. One is called the Cooper 12 minute test. That's a common test where essentially you just see how far you can run in 12 minutes, and then you plug your time or uh, you plug your distance into a calculator, and it will estimate your VO2 max. You can do a one mile run, a one and a half mile run test. Um, so several different ways that you can do it. But if you really want the gold standard, uh, you're going to have to do like a, a treadmill test or alternatively, you can exercise on a bike as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've taken like maybe three of these VR2 Max tests in my life. And uh, yeah, I, I, I guess it might be also like a, because, you know, if you're not used to doing this kind of exertion, then you might like cap out uh, or tap out before you re reach your actual true maximum limit so you need to realize like, i guess it also psychologically teach yourself to actually reach the limit if you want to learn about the true your own true uh, maximum uh, vo2 max and yeah, uh, definitely. it requires a little bit of going into like the pain cave or like just i guess like just realizing that okay this maximum isn't actually your maximum that you can actually go a bit uh, further yeah it's um it's very hard to do and uh, a lot of the times when you go and do one of those tests or if you're reading a, a research study where they report participants' cardiorespiratory fitness, they'll actually often use a, a term called VO2 peak. Mm. And that essentially indicates that the participant went as long as they could or you went as long as you could on the treadmill. But there were certain indicators that would um, would indicate that you didn't actually reach your maximal oxygen consumption. And so um, if I'm doing a VO2 max on somebody in the lab, um, and they they call it quits. They say, I can't run anymore. What we're going to do to confirm if they were at their VO2 max is were they within 10 beats per minute of their age predicted maximal heart rate? In addition to, you know, them just saying they can't go any longer. Um, we'll also measure something called respiratory exchange ratio or uh, otherwise known as respiratory quotient. That essentially is measuring the ratio of carbon dioxide produced to oxygen consumed. And it, it basically is an indicator of your 
uh, substrate utilization. So an RER of 1.1 is uh, indicative that you're burning almost all carbohydrates. Um, so glycolytic metabolism, uh, RER of 0.85 would be mostly fat metabolism, or sorry, uh, 0.85 would be somewhere in the middle. 0.7 would indicate kind of almost fat metabolism. So theoretically, if you're at your VO2 max, you're going to be burning nearly all carbohydrates to produce energy. And so you want to see an RER of 1.1. And then you want their RPE, their exertion to be at a 20 or around a 20, at 18 to 20, indicating that um, on a scale of six to 20. So, you know, mm. I feel that this is the hardest that I can go. So if all of those criteria are met, as well as, you know, we've reached a plateau in oxygen consumption, then you can call it a max. Otherwise, we just say VO2 peak. So they're pretty much the same thing, but there are um, some meaningful differences between those two. But mm -hmm. uh, going back to your point, doing multiple of those tests may be good, or at least doing two of them if you're really interested, because you learn during the first one, oh, you know, immediately when you stop that test, you think, oh, I could have gone 30 <laughs> seconds, lo 30 seconds longer or something like yeah. that. So um, the next time you go, you might be able to actually push yourself more and get kind of a few higher points on on that VO2 max test. Mm. Yeah, that, that's uh, I've been there <laughs> several times. Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes it's uh, also like, uh, I guess, the skill development of running on a treadmill, or if you're not used to doing that, then uh, you're kind of, yeah requires the skill side as well a little bit but um, yeah yeah when we're uh, talking about doing the tests then <clears throat> so what the at least of the people that i did the test with told me was that you know when you're doing the test it's gonna keep rising rising and at some point even though you're running faster your oxygen consumption like peaks and then it starts to like decrease slightly so uh, is that where the vo2 max is even though you're you're continuing to run or is it related to the speed at which you're going or yeah like is there any like before you actually reach a failure in terms of you planting you know face planting on the treadmill uh, is there like the vo2 max is reached before that before you actually face plant to the <laughs> treadmill right yeah the vo2 plateau is actually the the primary indicator that you've reached your vo2 max so say you're doing a stage maybe you're running in the treadmill is at a 10 percent grade and you're running at you know say six miles per hour they increase the grade but to 12% in seven miles per hour. And so you're running harder, but your oxygen consumption, like you said, you'll just see a, a plateau versus a, you know, it keeps going up. And that plateau means, oh, you're consuming as, the, as much oxygen as your body can't because you're continuing to run faster, but you're not consuming any more oxygen. So that's the main indicator of, oh, you actually reached your, uh, your VO2 max. Right. Gotcha. So what's the like... What's the uh, good amount? What's a good number for VO two max? And what's like the ranges? What's a bad VO two max? And what's a like a elite level VO two max? And what's like good for like mortality and longevity? Yeah, so it's obviously going to depend on several factors: age being one of them, sex being one of them, or whether you're a male or a female. So I'll kind of I'll do my best to maybe generalize and just say like if you're a man or a woman between. 30 and 50 or maybe like you know 20 and 40 years old this would be a good number so i would say there are some people out there and this isn't maybe based on the strongest of evidence but they would say if you're under 50 years old you should have a vo2 max of over 50 at least it should be over 50 mls per kg per minute um and i would i would stand by that i would say even you know, if you're not an endurance athlete, even if you don't do a lot of cardio, you should probably still get your VO2 max up to around 50 um, if you're, you know, age 50 or below. Now, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, I think mid-50s, mid to high 50s would be a good range to, to probably shoot for. That's just going to be your general, general fitness though. So, um, you know, if you're a CrossFit athlete, if you're mainly strength training based, but you do cardio a few days per week, somewhere around that 50 range, um, even 50 to 60 would be great. I think 45 even is kind of a recreationally active. Somebody might have a VO2 max of 40 to 45, but even then you're getting into the range where it might be a little bit low. Anything below 40 for somebody who's age 50 or below, maybe even 60 or below, that's, that's somewhat low. Um, you're kind of getting into the sedentary levels of, of fitness if you're kind of i think below below 30 um i'll go towards the lower end and then we can kind of talk about the higher end so 
what's a really bad VO2 max in terms of kind of clinical, bad clinical outcomes is somewhere around like 15 to 18. And why I say that is because that sort of represents this frailty threshold where you need at least a VO2 max of 15 to 18 to just complete activities of daily living. So getting out of bed, walking around the block to carry some groceries, going upstairs, those all require a minimum VO2 max of around 15 or so. And so if you fall below that, you can't really do anything. It's hard to get out of bed. It's hard to go up the stairs. And so once you're below that, you're in a territory, a dangerous territory of, you know, I can't really do much. This is kind of like what they uh, would call, refer to as like the frailty threshold for for fitness. Yeah. And then going to the other end of the spectrum, I think it's that if you're very, very cardiorespiratory uh, fit, a VO2 max of, you know, something in the 60s is fantastic, regardless of your age. Um, as you age past 50, you know, anything of a VO2 max above 50, and if you have something like a 60 is just incredible. Um, and then elite endurance athletes, um, sub elite and even then elite endurance athletes, they're probably going to have a VO2 max anywhere between 70 and 90. Um, those are typically, I think 70 seems to be kind of like the, uh, that's almost like the gate that you need to at least pass before you're even going to like be able to be considered to be like an elite endurance athlete. There's almost like a the VO2 max of a 70 is like a, a gatekeeper. So you'll typically won't find an endurance athlete with with a VO2 max below 70, maybe 65, but um, they're going to have to be really, really, really efficient if they have a VO2 max of 65 and they're competing at a high level. So between mm -hmm. 60, 60 and, and 90, and then you know, some of like the highest ever recorded are going to be like these uh, Norwegian cross country skiers, some of these cyclists who have recorded view to maxes in like, you know, the mid 90s, I even think 100. Uh, Oscar Svensson was a, a cyclist, I think he, he scored 100 VO2 max once, which is mm -hmm. just like absurd. So, right. Was he also like a fast cyclist then or? Oh, yeah, he I think was maybe Tour de France champion, but I definitely like a Tour de France uh, level mm -hmm. cyclist. So super elite. Yeah. yeah, I'm not super into the cycling world. I'm more kind of into the running world, but I just yeah. know he was a incredible cyclist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I've heard or I've seen that uh, Alaskan sled dogs have a VO2 max of like 200 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 200 and then horses. Horses, I think uh, I was reading a paper once where I think the horses had a VO2 max of like 350 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think hummingbirds actually have the highest VO2 max of any animal in the animal kingdom. I think that their VO2 max, I'll have to fact check, you know, this, but uh, somewhere like 800 to 1000, it's like right. absurdly high um, just because they're so small and they're all like, you know, fast twitch, like glycolytic muscle mm. fibers and whatever, because they got to fly all day long. So um, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, so what's the like age related decrease? So like 50 is a good number to aim for, for pretty much as long as you can, even if you're over 50 years old, that would be like a good goal to have. Uh, but uh, there's going to be some decrease re related to aging. So how big is that decrease? And uh, like, how can you slow it down? The, the decrease, as far as what the literature would indicate, seems to be about 10% per decade after about age 50 to 60. Between, between age 50 and 60, that's where the decline tends to start, um, maybe even sooner, depending on how active you stay. But around age 50, you're going to start to see about a 10% decrease in VO2 max per decade. And so let's use your example, I guess, just to kind of, you know, uh, work down or as somebody ages, you know, if you, if you have a VO2 max of 50, um, at age 50, so at age 60, you're going to have a VO2 max of 45 at age, uh, 70, you know, you're going to have a VO2 max of around 40. And then, you know, so say like five mLs per kg per decade. So mm. you know, that means by the time you're, you know, if you live to be 80, you know, you're going to have a VO2 max below 30, so 25 to 30, which is still above that threshold that we were talking about earlier, but it's it's still fairly low. Um, and that would kind of indicate that, one, 50 is a good target when you're 50 years old, but I think that that is good evidence to increase your VO2 max as high as you can before you start to reach that decline. So in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, do things to increase your view to max before it starts to decline, you know, build it up, maintain it for as long as possible. And then 
it does, uh, you know, before it inevitably starts to decline, as it seems to do in people who maintain their activity levels and people who decrease their activity levels, which is kind of depressing. Uh, you know, you see masters athletes and even their VO2 maxes start to decline um, around the same age. It declines at the same rate as people who don't in- nearly engage in kind of those levels mm-hmm. of activity. Right. But the important thing to note is obviously, so you have a master's athlete who's starting up here at age 50. You have somebody who doesn't exercise starting here. So if they decrease at the same rate, you'll notice that the master's athlete is still, you know, well above the right. sedentary person. So you're going to have a higher VO2 max at the same age, even though it declines um, at a similar rate. So you're going to be, you know, ultimately at age 80, 85, 90, you're going to have a higher, a higher VO2 max. Um, so you need like a, just a buffer zone like a bigger uh, reserve kind of. Exactly. You know, similar to like muscle mass, you know, you want to build as much muscle mass as you can in your thirties and your forties and your fifties, because sure you can build muscle with age. Of course you can maintain muscle mass with age, but for the most part, it seems that muscle mass declines as we get older. And so you want to build up that reserve before, you know, things start to decline. Um, Something interesting though, is that there is, there's a researcher, his name is Ben Levine. Um, he works at UT Southwestern and he is a huge, huge research in cardiovascular and cardiac physiology and how the heart changes with aging. And he would seem to, I think, argue that you can probably maybe maintain your VO2 max for a little bit longer or prevent some of that decline. If you really engage in a lot of exercise, you're going to have to train hard, but like if you're 50 or you're 60, maybe VO2 max doesn't inevitably decline, but you're going to have to engage in a lot of high intensity training, really work on your base endurance training and things like that. So it's certainly possible to increase your VO2 max as you get older, um, depending on your fitness levels and maybe prolong the decline. But what most people obviously do naturally is just exercise less. I mean, Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, you know, when you're 50, you're not the same as when you were 30 and you're probably exercising in a different way. You're probably not, you know, if you were exercising for 15 hours a week when you were 30, you know, maybe when you're 50 or 60, you're not exercising that much. But Mm -hmm. if you were somehow able to maintain those levels of exercise, then, you know, I think that there could be an argument perhaps that we could kind of maintain our fitness levels. Same goes for muscle mass um, for a bit longer. But it just seems that a lot of people go through these periods where, they're not exercising. So your fitness decreases. The next time you do that, it decreases a bit more. So um, it's just an inevitable consequence of becoming less active, essentially. Mm. Yeah, like I, th- I think in the muscle loss side, there is that you're not like gradually losing the muscle that much. It's more about you lose it very fast during periods of being sedentary or injury. And uh, then at other times when you are exercising, you are slowing it down. So it's, you know, over the course of decades, you just have too many times of being sedentary or missing out on the potential gains. And uh, yeah, like at the other times, it's harder to like build it to regain it. So you never get back to your baseline. So you're all just kind of a step wise decline rather than like a, like a, you know, like a sand. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's what happens for sure. And it's a lot easier to lose fitness uh, than it is to to gain it back. You know, if you within, you know, two to three weeks, even if you're say sick, say you get COVID or something like that, and you don't exercise for two weeks, your fitness levels can just crash during those two weeks without any activity. And then to build that up, it could take months of heavy training. So it's really, it's really not fair how biology kind of works like that. You know, you'll lose Mm -hmm. muscle mass within like one to two days of stopping working out, or at least it feels like it. And then it feels like it takes you uh, a week or a year to, to regain what you lost. But uh, like this doesn't probably happen if you're like, you know, 20, 30 years old, uh, or does it already happen at that point? It's just going to be easier to regain it. Yes. It's, I think that that's the key. I think it's easier right. to regain it at that age. But even if you're 20 and you're saying like doing bed rest or something or inactive for a few weeks where you're really not doing anything, you can still lose a lot of fitness. Um, and actually, the fitter you are, the more fitness you actually might lose. So if you take a really fit athlete and they do nothing for a month, they're obviously going to lose a lot of fitness because they have a lot of fitness to begin with. Right. Um, whereas somebody who's not fit, you know, they might not have that much to lose. But I think that the athletes can regain that. Um, fitness back quicker in part due to kind of a quote unquote muscle memory type of thing. I know that that's kind of a word that 
people mm. might like look down upon, but I think our muscles and even our heart cardiovascular system has kind of this memory where, oh, it remembers, you know, you used to be an athlete, you used to lift a lot of weights. And so once you start training again, um, you'll re regain that fitness fairly quickly. Mm. Right. So when it comes to like VO2 max and cardiorespiratory fitness, so what are the things that you need to train? So obviously <laughs> you need to like do uh, cardio and different methods of the cardio, but do you need to like, what's the biggest, like, uh, like, I guess, organ that does the biggest lifting in terms of that figuratively speaking that, uh, is it the heart? Is it the lungs? Is it uh, your calf muscles? Is it your whatever, like other type of, uh, physical function? Yeah, obviously you want to train, you know, by exercising, you're, you're going to, you're going to be training everything, but right. in terms of what the, I guess the limiting factor for VO2 max, at least in, in athletes who are somewhat fit. The consensus seems to be that is that it is your stroke volume. And what your stroke volume is, is how much blood your heart can pump every time it beats. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you look at elite athletes and say like, oh, where if, you know, what's like the limiting factor for their VO2 max? Is it their lungs, the, their ability to get oxygen in? No, that doesn't appear to be the case because our lungs actually are overbuilt for exercise. So they're really, we have more lung capacity than um, we really need to do the job of getting oxygen to to our body and getting enough oxygen in. So the lungs don't se seem to be the limiter in healthy people. Now, if someone has like asthma or bronchitis or a pulmonary disease, that's that's different. Their lungs are going to be limiting their performance there. Um, the mitochondria don't also seem to be kind of the limiting factor. So if you you know give the mitochondria more oxygen, they will readily utilize that oxygen. So most people, I guess, would say you know they have enough mitochondrial capacity, but the heart really seems to be kind of what's what's limiting. Um, and so, it's you can't just, I guess, train stroke volume. I mean, you kind of can. You do endurance training, low intensity, steady state endurance training tends to be good at improving stroke volume because you're allowing the heart to fill kind of fully with blood and eject that blood. So it's working on actually increasing the size of that heart muscle, um, and the thickness of that heart muscle too. Um, so that's known as eccentric hypertrophy. So if you looked at an endurance athlete's heart, they have a very, very large left ventricle. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a physiological adaptation. It can kind of increase the risk for atrial fibrillation and things like that. Um, and put them at risk for that, whether that's necessarily like harmful is kind of a subject of debate, but they have a large ventricle. And so that seems to be one of the main adaptations when you do endurance training, your heart is going to get bigger, your left ventricle is going to get bigger, it's able to pump out more blood. And that's one of the things that actually helps to increase your VO2 max. So if your heart can pump more blood to the rest of the body, um, it gets, you know, it can circulate more oxygen, it can deliver more oxygen to your muscles, your mitochondria, and then your body can use that to, to produce energy. Mm. Um, and so I mentioned the best way to kind of train that would be lower maybe intensity low to moderate intensity like endurance training but then obviously i think what that what high intensity training does is obviously important too it does help improve your mitochondrial capacity increase mitochondrial enzymes um, increase the ability of the mitochondria to produce energy um, better than low intensity training act seems to be so high intensity seems to be better for that low intensity i would argue is probably better for maybe increasing stroke volume even mm. though some studies would show you know, high intensity training can improve stroke volume as well. But that's why you need a little bit of, of both as everyone, you know, all the arguments eventually boil down to. Right. So the enlargement of the heart is just this positive adaptation to the, uh, I guess, the exercise training. And, uh, you know, may maybe there is yeah, like a point of diminishing returns at some point, like, you know, you mentioned that if it's uh, harmful is, uh, is debated. But uh, if you look at like, you know, generally athletes or like not necessarily like elite elite athletes, but, you know, I guess like recreational athletes and like slightly more, uh, more athletic people do have a lower risk of all cause mortality and heart disease. So, yeah, even even with uh, the potential risk of this AFib, then I, I guess the total outcome is still that uh, those individuals have a lower risk uh, of uh, heart disease overall. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, there's, I'm sure maybe you're aware that there's kind of this, this recent data that the lifelong endurance athletes, um, 
they present with a little more coronary artery calcification. They're having some studies showing that Right. Mostly these studies are in men, um, but you know, if they've been doing endurance training all their life. They're runners, they're cyclists, they're triathletes. They have higher levels of coronary artery calcium compared to people who exercise less um, or even sedentary individuals. But the plaque tends to be more calcified uh, and hard plaque versus soft plaque. And you know, we don't have to go into the details of what all that means, but essentially there's the argument that the calcified plaque is less likely to rupture. So they're not really at a risk of higher risk of a stroke or a heart attack than people who have less calcium. It's just that the calcium is like a different morphology. Um, mm-hmm. and the same goes for atrial fibrillation, you know, endurance athletes, they almost have like a five times greater risk of atrial fibrillation compared to wow. the general population. But as you mentioned, all the other studies would show that despite that, they suffer from less cardiovascular events. They tend to live longer on average. So it doesn't seem to translate to the outcomes. So there seem to be these other adaptations that are going on that are probably protecting against uh, the other risk factors that that might be higher. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know about those calcification studies as well that you know, yeah, even if they have higher calcium slightly, then uh, they still have a lower risk than the sedentary people. <laughs> so exercise is so powerful that even though it increases your coronary artery calcification, at some point it still lowers your total risk, which, you know, means that you still want to do it uh, and uh, still want to engage in that kind of activity. Yeah, uh, definitely. But I guess what, what's the like mechanism for that, the calcification? So it's like just inflammation or the chronic stress if you do it like too much or? Yeah, I think multiple things. So inflammation is probably certainly one. You know, we, we know that, you know, high intensity training does lead to at least acute inflammation. So that could be one of the mechanisms. Um, you know, you are placing a lot of stress on the heart when you're doing endurance activity. You're elevating things like you know, these damage markers that are increased, you know, that the heart releases kind of during endurance exercise. There's just the physical act of blood flow, which is was good for our cardiovascular system, but the blood flow may be causing, you know, some sort of fibrosis or inflammation. And so really it could just be that, you know, if you exercise for too hard, uh, too hard for too long, and you don't really give your heart time to recover and over years and years and years, you're kind of just getting this more of this calcification, you know, that that necessarily isn't my area of expertise, but I think that that's kind of the, right. some of the mechanisms that that might be contributing to that. Um, I also think that, you know, we're kind of just beginning and especially endurance athletes to kind of place a priority on also looking at our diet quality, you know, of course, like, you know, you always think of endurance runners as like being skinny, but it doesn't necessarily mean they eat the best, you know, maybe they eat a diet that's high in sugar or their cholesterol levels are high. And one of the things I think that we don't know about some of the men in these studies, and we actually do know some things about them is like, well, a lot of them were former smokers. Um, we don't really have anything about their diet quality. You know, what was their cholesterol levels? What were their ABOB levels like? And so I think until we know that, you know, I think I would argue that you know, maybe yeah. if your diet is very healthy and you're watching your cholesterol levels or, and things like that, maybe you don't get this calcification. Um, another thing is when do you start exercising? If you start late in life, maybe you still get that calcification. But like someone like myself, you know, I, I started exercising. I started doing endurance athletics at age 13. So will I have the same outcomes as someone who started doing endurance training when they were 40 years old. Um, right. I'm not sure. So I think that there's yeah. a lot we have to learn about that. And I'm, I'm kind of interested to see this, this area uh, evolve as we learn more and more of these studies come out. Yeah, like it might be that they got the plaque before they started running from whatever other lifestyle activities. And, uh, you know, it's some one of those tests that you most people don't do it, you know, rarely, maybe like once or even most people don't do, do it even once. So it's like hard to know when did it come there and why did it come there? So it's, yeah, kind of retrospective. Right. And, you know, if you were a smoker from age 20 to 40 and then you decided to stop smoking, start endurance training, you know, I maybe you can't erase the effects of smoking or heavy drinking early in life. Mm. I think there's so- certainly something to be said about that too. Mm. And uh, funny that you mentioned the this the calcification so i saw one of your publications from a few years ago was on sleep and endothelial 
function, so sleep deprivation. So that then obviously can also like affect that. So if you're not like sleeping enough or you're just sleep deprived, then that's also like a risk factor for the coronary artery calcification. Yeah, definitely. We can, you know, I think that there's, we have to consider the overlapping kind of risk factors. So certainly, you know, if there's someone who's an endurance athlete and you're also not sleeping well, could that, could that kind of combine? Um, interestingly though, there have been some studies that, you know, these are all kind of observational studies, but they would suggest that if you don't sleep enough, but you get a decent level of exercise during the week, that that kind of counteracts it. So being active mm. can counteract some of the negative effects of not sleeping as well. Now, of course, you know, sleeping well and exercising, that's the best. But then right. if you're a poor sleeper, but you exercise, that's also okay. Um, I don't think getting enough sleep can make up for not exercising though. No. So right. <laughs> I think somebody who yeah. exercises, somebody who exercises and doesn't sleep well is going to be better off than someone who sleeps well, but doesn't exercise. That's kind of mm -hmm. my hypothesis there. Um, but you know, obviously you want to do both of them if, if you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, if the exercise you're already doing too much or, and it starts to impede your sleep, then, uh, then you need to sleep more. <laughs> so it's kind of yeah. depends, on, depends on the person. Right. Right. At least chronically, I think mm. I'm, I'm always posting about this kind of on social media, but you know, there are times where, you know, say we have an early morning flight or something like that. I will, I'm not, you know, I'll never hesitate to sacrifice a few hours of sleep if it means I'm going to get a workout in for that day. Now you can't do that every day and nor do I think anyone should. I think if, I think if you have to do that, you kind of need to reassess your schedule and your life and, you know, how do I make both of these things work? But once or twice a month, there will be a time where I have to say, oh, I could get eight hours of sleep, but I'm going to get six and I'm going to do a workout versus sleep eight hours and skip my workout. I think that is totally fine if you do that once or twice. And in fact, I think that, again, there are some actually good experimental studies showing that if you exercise during a period of sleep deprivation, it kind of counteracts the negative effects on endothelial function or yeah. mitochondrial function or protein synthesis. So if you are sleep deprived, if you're a clinician and maybe you're doing a night shift or something like that, exercise before going in, it seems to actually be better, which I think is kind of cool, cool data because all of us lose out on sleep every now and then. Nobody's perfect in getting, you know, seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. Mm, right. Uh, so let's talk about then the, you mentioned this low intensity and high intensity exercise. I guess that's one of the biggest questions people have. So like, should I do this? hit cardio or should i do zone two cardio so yeah what's the kind of what do the studies say about it like what is more effective in terms of raising vo2 max and uh you know obviously like we said <laughs> the in, the answer in the end is going to be that you need to do both but yeah like how would you like stru structure the ratios of how much of uh, each that's that's obviously one of the kind of main uh areas of debate among you know, physiologists and, and exercise scientists and, and things like that. So the, I think in my mind, you know, I've read most of the literature on like what, what I haven't read most of the literature, but what most of the literature would say is that inevitably high intensity interval training and granted most of the studies in this area are just going to be eight to 12 weeks long. That's just the nature of studies in exercise science. They're going to be eight to 12 weeks long. They're not two, three, four, five year long studies. So I'll kind of talk about maybe the implication of that later, but high intensity training is better for improving VO2 max, better for improving your fitness kind of in the short term. So if you were to say you take an exercise program where somebody's doing 60 minutes a day of, let's just refer to it as zone two training, uh, three to four days a week, or they're doing high intensity interval training, uh, three to four days a week, but it's only 20 to 30 minutes. They tend to get more fit when they do that high intensity interval training. So yes, that would say that, oh, well, you should just do high intensity interval training if you're looking to improve your view to max. Sure. That's kind of what it means. But one of the, um, caveats with high intensity training is that you can't do it every single day. You know, these studies, they have people doing it for three days per week for, you know, eight to 12 weeks. But he, and even then, that's a lot. And then after the twelve weeks, they're not they're not continuing to do that. So it's very intense training for a period of twelve weeks. So hit constant hit long term just isn't sustainable. And so you need to find something else that will improve your fitness or at least help 
you know, work on that baseline fitness um, that doesn't cause the autonomic um, stress, the cardiovascular stress that high intensity interval training does. And that's where kind of your lower moderate intensity zone two training comes in. Mm. Now it doesn't, it doesn't have zero benefits for VO2 max, of course. But I just think that, you know, if, if we look long-term and say like, you really want to elevate your ceiling well, doing just low intensity training, isn't going to do that. There are benefits to it. It improves, you know, your fat oxidation. It improves your mitochondrial function. Um, it will improve your, you know, your heart, your cardiac function too. And all of those things are important for elevating your VO2 max, but only doing hot aerobic training will not increase your VO2 max. Whereas unless you're very unfit. I mean, if you take somebody with a very low baseline fitness level, you know, walking could increase their VO2 max. So you obviously have to consider someone's baseline fitness. But if you're a relatively fit person, um, if you just do moderate training, you're probably not going to increase your VO2 max much. If you do high intensity training, you'll increase it a lot. But what most of us want long term is, you know, something that we can do every week for years and years and years and years. And what that leads us to is a distribution that um, involves some low intensity, some moderate intensity training, and then some high intensity interval training. Mm, what, the, yeah. what the break, what the breakdown needs to be. That's, you know, another topic of debate. You'll hear a lot of, you'll hear a lot about 80, 20 training, you know, where 80% of your total weekly volume should kind of be in this lower to moderate intensity. And 20% of your training should be high intensity, um, you know, at a heart rate that is equivalent to a high intensity. I think that that is a good framework if you are kind of leaning more towards endurance activity and your total weekly volume is pretty high. So if you're exercising for eight or more hours per week, I think that that breakdown is is pretty solid. If you're someone who is lifting weights and just supplementing with cardio, say maybe you're just doing, maybe you're doing three days per week, 30 to 60 minutes each time. I think that you could probably skew that distribution a little bit more in favor of the high intensity to kind of help maximize those adaptations. So maybe you're doing like 70, 30 or 60, 40. Um, I think that there's something to be said about that. So I think that the lower your total weekly volume is, the you can afford to do a little bit more high intensity training. And no, this doesn't mean going to the wall every single day and go, or going to the well every single day and ending your workout feeling like you, you know, you, can, you shouldn't like move for the rest of the day because you're so exhausted. I think that there's sort of this, the nomenclature is bad with high intensity because it's either, oh, you're either high intensity or you're low intensity. Whereas the reality is there's a lot of intensities in between. You can do threshold training, which it's kind of high intensity, but it's not, you know, 80 to 90% of your, or 90 to hundred percent of your maximal aerobic capacity. It's more like 80%. So you can do a little bit of that too. So there's all of these, you know, intensities that, that factor into it. Um, but I do think just kind of what I generally say, and what I generally recommend is, you know, if you're doing a lot of volume, that 80, 20 can kind of apply, but if you're really just trying to optimize your fitness and you're doing two to three days per week of cardio, don't be scared maybe to do a little bit more high intensity training than the 80 20 advocates would kind of say because they're largely relying on observational data with that 80 20 that comes from athletes doing a lot of volume of exercise you know like 20 to 25 hours per week you know cyclists right. who are just exercising for four to five hours per day so those are different than most of us who are not exercising that much mm -hmm. yeah, and i guess the reason they do it is because of, yeah, they don't want to risk injury and they don't want to overtrain. So they need to rack up the long hours to get the same effects from, uh, from the training. Right. And if you think about it, I mean, even if they're doing 20% of their exercise training per week, um, if they're doing 20 to 25 hours per week, that means they're doing four to five hours of high intensity interval training. I mean, most people don't exercise a total of four to five hours in a week, but these people are going to be doing four hours of just high intensity, but they're doing 20, you know, 18 to 20 hours of low intensity aerobic training. So, you know, even if you're doing half of your high intensity interval training, but you're doing 150 minutes per week, you're doing 75 minutes of high intensity training, which isn't, you know, that much relatively speaking. Mm, gotcha. And uh, is the an another reason I saw that 
that the, the hit intervals tend to do better in the short term studies is because they increase they like burn more calories and you expend more energy doing them so like if you do 20 minute hit session you burn more calories than doing like a 60 minute uh, zone two cardio session and that's the giving the like adaptations because of the higher energy expenditure like is there any like truth to that yeah i think so um so the we would consider it kind of like their work match so they're matched for you know what's your like output during the session whether you measure the output in calories or kilojoules or or whatever so and the studies typically do that and they even show that even when they're matched for output so say say same caloric burn high intensity training still seems to perform a little bit better than moderate intensity training but mm-hmm. they do equal them out so 60 minutes of moderate intensity training at a heart rate of 65% is say the same caloric burn as 40 minutes of high intensity training at 85% of your max even mm-hmm. though it's 40% of you know or 40 minutes versus 60 minutes or even 30 minutes so less time with high intensity training um but similar caloric burn still leads to cardiovascular adaptations that are superior. So that's kind of one of the benefits why HIT has kind of been advocated so much is because even when it's work matched to endurance training, low intensity endurance training, it's it's somewhat superior. Again, in the short term of you know the eight to twelve weeks. Mm. And I guess another problem here might be that uh, let's see the average person here is okay hits are good hit cardio is good or better so they start doing hit but they're not actually doing hit so they're like because they're not used to like they don't know what their 85 percent of their max heart rate is so they're like doing some somewhere between like you know 75 or maybe even like 65 because that's not that's what they're kind of uh used to uh in terms of like the average uh, life so they think that's like okay i'm doing hit but in reality they might be doing only like zone two or zone three uh, kind of yeah, it takes a while to to kind of learn, you know, uh, what hit actually is. Like you said, if if you take someone who's never exercised before and you tell them to go hard, you know, go get on the bike and go as hard as you can, they might only be at 75% of their heart rate, but because they're so un- detrained, you know, their muscular system is kind of detrained. So they're gonna they're gonna get that muscle burn, but they might their heart rate might not be that high. So I would certainly um it, it takes time to kind of learn that, but then I would certainly recommend that people figure out, you know, or get an idea of what their maximal heart rate is so that they can actually look at it using their watch during exercise to see where you actually are. Because true high intensity interval training, it it should be at 85% or more of your maximal heart rate. And, you know, that's high. It takes a lot to, to do that. Um, and as for how to estimate that, you know, you've probably heard of the 220 minus your age is sort of what your age predicted maximal heart rate is. That seems to work. It'll give you a general idea of what your maximal heart rate is, but it's not, it doesn't work for everybody. There are very, you know, there are individual differences in maximal heart rate and things like that. And so I would recommend, you know, that people do kind of a test to maybe determine what their max heart rate is, go do a VO2 max test or, find a protocol to determine their max heart rate because it can be kind of valuable versus just relying on that equation that doesn't always produce the most accurate um, estimation of your max heart rate. Mm. Yeah, and I guess, you know, sometimes if you're fitter, then that number might not be uh, that accurate, but it, you know, is a good estimate in the beginning kind of to know that. Yeah, and the fitter you are, yeah, I mean, because for instance, just to use an example, I'm 30 years old. And so if I use that equation, 220 minus my age, my maximal heart rate should be 190. Um, my real maximal heart rate is only about 185 to 186, something like that, measured on multiple occasions. So there's no way I'm getting my heart rate to 190 beats per minute. Um, it's just not that, you know, my I have a low maximal heart rate, a low resting heart rate too. So um if I were to try to use that 190, it would, you know, be really hard for me to actually get there. But knowing that my heart rate is actually lower because I've actually tested it, uh, you know, it can actually lead you to kind of an accurate zone when you're when you're exercising. So you're like lower resting heart rate facilitates the lower maximum heart rate, or um, not not always. I just think that there are 
kind of genetic and other factors that come into play for determining max heart rate. Um, I guess sometimes, I mean, not always though, if you, if you have a lower resting heart rate, you can still have a high maximum heart rate. I know there are elite athletes with resting heart rates that are, you know, very low, similar to mine, but that also maybe have a maximal heart rate of, of 200. So it doesn't always mean that, you know, you'll have a low, low, that both will be low. Gotcha. And when it comes to hit intervals, so like how should they structure the what's like is there any like uh, optimal method to do the hits like how long the intervals or how long should they rest between the intervals yeah the thing with the intervals is there are so many variations and a lot of variations will work for improving vo2 max um the, the best that we can do is kind of look at what are some of the intervals used in the different studies and how well those work um a common protocol that is used to improve VO2 max is the Norwegian 4x4 protocol, which is essentially you do four rounds of four minutes at 85 to 100% of your maximal heart rate with three-minute recovery in between. So you're going to do four minutes hard, three minutes easy, four minutes hard, three minutes easy, four minutes hard, three minutes easy, four minutes hard, three minutes easy. So it's a very short workout. The four minute intervals at, you know, 85% plus of your maximal heart rate are certainly not easy. It's doable, but it, it hurts pretty bad. And so I think long duration intervals are, are good for improving VO2 max. Uh, I would think something two, three, four, five, six minutes. Those are all going to be great. Um, that's not to say that you know, doing 30 second intervals can't improve your VO2 max because sprint interval training where they do 15 minutes hard, 15 minutes rest, and they repeat that, you know, 15, 20, 30 times that can also improve your VO2 max. Um, but I would say the longer kind of one to four minute intervals, that will be a pretty good like sweet spot for people to target. If you're really looking to, to optimize that, like VO2 max, when you get to the lower ends, you know, you're going to be really pushing the power output. And so those are kind of good glycolytic type uh, intervals. But the longer stuff is going to be good for working that threshold heart rate, kind of pushing that upper ceiling of, of VO2 max. Um, so the Norwegian 4x4 I just mentioned, that's a common protocol used in studies. It's not the magic bullet. It's not the only interval workout that's going to improve your VO2 max. But I bring that one up. It's just commonly brought up because it's frequently used um, and it seems to be quite effective. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, like uh, uh, I think some of the lo if you do like longer in the interval, then that at least some of the meta analysis have found that that's kind of gives more than short intervals. So like four minutes uh, and above is better than like thirty seconds or less than one minute. Yeah, it does seem to be it does seem to be better than thirty second intervals. So those thirty second intervals are better than you know the moderate intensity training, but they're not as good as maybe the four minute intervals. And mm -hmm. then if you're going any longer than say five minutes, ten minutes plus, then you're just going to be kind of compromising intensity at that point. And so that's right. probably why those are not as effective. They can be mm -hmm. effective for improving your VO two max, but um, you know if you're doing a ten minute interval, <laughs> it's going to be hard to maintain your 85 to 90 percent heart rate for that long and you're just going to risk getting fatigued and not really the quality of the intervals is going to suffer yeah like at that point you're not really going as fast as you think you are <laughs> right right you're exactly yeah down. people right people you know that you'll get people saying like oh well you should go do a go do a one minute sprint well I'm like well nobody's sprinting for a minute you can't sprint <laughs> for a minute you might feel like you are but that a sprint is your maximal yeah. intensity and you can't nobody can really do that for uh for a minute <laughs> yeah i mean the first 10 seconds you sprint and then after that you slowly s slow down and uh... yeah exactly have you ever um do you, have you heard of uh, a wingate test yeah have you ever taken one uh no Okay. So that's kind of a similar thing. Essentially, it's like you pedal as fast as you can and then on a bicycle and then a weight drops. And so you pedal against this resistance for, it's only 30 seconds long, but you mm -hmm. just see, you know, for the first five seconds, your power output is up here and then it just goes down every second until 30 seconds. So it's like, you really realize that you only have two to three seconds of your ATP PCR system energy stores, and then you just start to to fatigue like rapidly after that because your body just can't produce energy that fast. <laughs> mm, right. What about the so like if someone is doing the long training, so low intensity training zone two. So how 
what's uh, so like is, is it like the more you do it the better or is there any also like optimal amount of uh, doing it i think you will get people saying more the better and i would i would probably be one of those people i mean you know everyone has time constraints and you know depending on your previous training history or a level of fitness you know you're only going to be able to handle so much volume in a week but i think that for zone two training 300 minutes a week so five hours would be a great target for some people i know that that seems like a lot especially if people are doing resistance training and everything else that they have to do but i think that there's solid evidence that if you do 300 minutes per week that that would be a great goal um as for then the lower intensity training so zone two is going to be something like 60 to 70 percent so that's still somewhat hard it's not easy training by any means but it's it's not intense training I would say for something though, like less than 50% of your heart rate. So maybe a brisk walk, just do as much of that as you possibly can. I mean, movement like that is just going to be good and really will not risk overtraining injury, anything like that. I mean, doing a very easy pedal on a bicycle or going out for a walk, those aren't going to raise your injury risk, nor are they really going to, you know, increase your risk of say burning out or overtraining however you want to say it those provide really a low risk for that so there's a lot of benefit to just like volume wise doing as much of that stuff as you can mm. and uh, yeah like any you know you can do it on a bike you can do it while running uh, the rowing machine like any anything is pretty much good to go yeah i would say so um i'm a big fan of the bike for low intensity training. Um, I'm a runner, but I like to do when I go out for a run, I like to maybe increase the pace a little bit more. Um, cause I think I find that running slow, your biomechanics change a lot. So it can kind of feel awkward. I like the, I like how it feels to run fast. My body like feels good. And then on the bike, whether you're going slow or fast, your biomechanics are kind of the same. So you're not going to change. So I'm a fan of using the bike for low intensity training, but yeah, any, anything will do biking, running, walking, rowing machine, elliptical, um, whatever you like to do best. Gotcha. Uh, what do you say about people saying that, you know, running is going to wreck your knees or <laughs> that uh, too much, you know, whatever cardio or any other, this low intensity training is going to like lead to some form of uh, injury? Yeah. I mean, there's certainly something to be said about, you know, if you increase your volume or intensity too much that risking injury, the whole, uh, running is bad for your knees thing has been debunked kind of several times uh meta analyses show that people who run have lower rates of knee osteoarthritis than people who don't mm. do any exercise so i mean being overweight being sedentary that's the worst thing that you can do to increase your osteoarthritis risk um running seems to actually be protective against knee osteoarthritis um so that you know the whole that whole thing is definitely kind of been debunked um but obviously you know if you if you train a lot you're going you can increase your risk for certain injuries and i think that you just have to be safe about not sharply increasing your volume just you know increase there's kind of a rule out there i don't necessarily follow it myself but it can be good for people to use um just increase your whether it's volume and time or your mileage or your kilometers uh, in running like 10 percent per week um, i think that that's a solid strategy um so mm -hmm. it allows you to not increase too fast and risk injury but overall i mean i think that just like there's no argument that being sedentary is far worse than exercising. Sure, there are some people who overdo it. I overdo it mm. plenty of times to get myself hurt. Mm -hmm. But overall, the outcomes for people who exercise are going to be better. And very few people are exercising too much where they need to worry about, oh my gosh, I really need to limit how much exercise that I'm doing. Right. Yeah. And I guess the form also matters. So you need to like learn the form a little bit to not like heel strike or yeah, form is important. Shoes are kind of important too. I think that in the last five years, we've really seen, and this is specific to running, obviously, but we've seen this proliferation of the, the super shoes. So, you know, the Nike, they have the Alpha Fly, and now every company, every running shoe company has some sort of shoe with a carbon fiber plate or a super shoe. And a lot of people are wearing these super shoes, but one of the things that is not talked about a lot is how they really change your biomechanics of running, even for elite athletes. And they're designed to be run fast in. 
if you've ever put these shoes on and just done like a jog, it feels very awkward. And the more, mm. the faster that you run, the better that they feel. But I'll go out uh, to do a trail run or run around the town and, and I'll see people just doing their general training runs in these shoes. And I don't have data for this. I'm not a orthopedic you know, surgeon or a physical therapist, but I think that they're probably contributing to a slightly higher risk of injuries among people who, like you said, haven't really worked on their running form uh, or really considered it. And then they just put on these shoes and think that they're going to just help them run faster, but they could actually lead to injuries because of how they change uh, the way you run. Mm, gotcha. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk more was uh, as well it is the idea of nutrition. So like do certain foods help you to increase your VO2 max or are there any foods that decrease it? So what's the data about that? Yeah, interesting. Um, I can't say that there are any foods that would increase your VO2 max. There are a few supplements that I won't say they would. The only way to actually, you know, increase your true VO2 max is to is to exercise more. But there are actually a few supplements that have kind of shown might increase or decrease VO2 max when you combine them with training. Um, one of those supplements is nitrates or beetroot juice. So mm -hmm. there is ton of literature on beetroot juice showing that it is a performance enhancer. Mostly though, uh, unfortunately, I guess in, in like older people or people with heart failure, it really seems to help their exercise performance. Um, but I think that there are some studies in trained populations, endurance athletes showing that beetroot juice can help improve like your VO2 max. And why that occurs is because it, it allows you to deliver more oxygen to uh, your skeletal muscle and your mitochondria because beetroot juice contains nitrates, which get converted into nitric oxide. Nitric oxide vasodilates blood vessels and allows for a greater delivery of blood flow. Um, so people can supplement with nitrates, beetroot juice. That seems to have a beneficial effect um, if you combine that too with like your training. So take it before training, take it after training. Um, supplement it with a few weeks that might actually be able to increase your view to max which is kind of uh interesting there's not really much else that that i'm aware of um no like foods that you can eat to to increase it in interestingly um creatine which is a hot supplement these days um i have taken it myself a lot of people are, are starting to take it there was actually one study that showed supplementing with creatine might actually reduce your vo2 max so there was a study of endurance runners uh, half of them supplemented with creatine, half of them did it. At the end of the study, they were also training during this study. Um, and I'm not sure how long it was. I kind of forget the duration of that study. But at the end of the study, the uh, group who supplemented with creatine actually had a lower VO2 max than the group who didn't. And some of that was due to the fact that the group who supplemented with creatine gained weight. That's one of the side effects, quote, side effects of creatine. It tends to promote water retention and you might gain a little a little weight uh, maybe a little bit of extra muscle um, but that would reduce your relative vo2 max because that's expressed to body weight so if i don't get any fitter but i gain weight my vo2 max is actually going to go down because my body weight is higher um so i don't i don't think that you should be concerned about that if you're taking creatine don't to say that it's going to lower your vo2 max but um just kind of one of the studies that i think is it's kind of interesting to point out showing that it actually decreases rather than increases it, which we might expect. Mm. Yeah, I've seen that study as well. And yeah, probably maybe just the muscle mass or the water retention uh, that occurs. But it does like, you know, because I mean, I would imagine bodybuilders, <laughs> they don't necessarily have like a super high VO2 max, maybe because of not training it or not doing cardio, but is like, is too much muscle counterproductive for the VO2 max? Well, if you, it, yeah, I mean, if you increase your muscle, you're going to increase your absolute VO2 max just because more muscle needs more oxygen. And so your VO2, your VO2 will increase, but at the risk of, yes, you know, if you're an endurance athlete, say, and you put on five to 10 pounds of muscle that I don't think would necessarily be beneficial because your, your relative VO2 max will go down. You're going to be like less efficient because you, you weigh more, but I definitely think that there is a point of you know, if you add one to two pounds of muscle and your VO2 max is already pretty high, then that muscle probably benefits you more than one to two points in VO2 max. If I gain five pounds of muscle, 
I think if, if my VO2 max would go down a little bit, but I think that that muscle would benefit me more than that VO2 max would because it's already high enough that it's not right. going to dip below something that's going to like decrease my uh, performance. Uh, gotcha. Right. And from a longevity perspective as well, you need a kind of a balance of both to a certain extent. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. So um, there's always that that argument. Like, so sure, you want to get your view to max as high as possible. But if all you're doing is endurance training, then you're going to sacrifice some muscle. So like, what's the balance of how do I maximize my view to max? But how do I also kind of maximize muscle mass by training both of those systems? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's interesting because you don't want to neglect one for the other. Same goes for strength training. Yes, you want to maximize muscle mass, but I think that there is probably a threshold above which more muscle isn't beneficial. Same probably goes for VO2 max. You know, I mean, if you go from 75 to 80, I'm not sure that that will help you live longer. Um, you know, so I, there's, you know, there's a, there's a threshold for everything where the benefits start to, to level off. Mm. Yeah, like what I've seen is that the 50 is the highest threshold for the longevity side. Uh, but that might be because no one has researched what's you know higher than that. Uh, what th they do find that the Olympic athletes still live longer than the general population, so like five years longer than the general population, and they probably have a higher VO2 max as well than like fifty. They have like maybe in their sixties and seventies. So yeah, have you have you seen yeah. anything any studies about like what's what's the like the highest VO2 max linked to the lowest mortality? Yeah, I don't think we we know that yet. You know the the one study that is kind of shown to have the there's no upper limit to the vo2 max the the highest vo2 max in that study was i think around like 55 maybe even 60 so i think that right now we'd be able to say something like that is probably where the plateau occurs but um the data on the olympians and then there was that recent study that came out in the they studied i think it was around 300 so the uh, the first 300 men to or 200 men to break four minutes in the mile um, they studied them and found that they lived uh, like four to five years longer than men of the general population. And obviously, if you're a sub four minute miler, you probably have a few two max in the 70s, at least, you know, 70 to 80. Um, so I'm not sure that going up that high keeps, re you know, returning those benefits. But uh, I think that it might. But I think we need to learn more. So right now, I think that the the kind of threshold would be somewhere around that 55 to 60. 60 is like, if you get up to there, you're going to further reduce your, you know, lifespan and health span um, above somebody at a 55. But whether like 60 to 65 improves it, uh, I'm not quite sure. I think we need maybe a little more data on that. Yeah, I would hypothesize, I would speculate it's probably a bit higher, maybe even up to 70. But then once you hit that 70, maybe, uh, you know, possibly not. Right, yeah. All right. Well, it's been great talking with you and uh, discussing these topics. Uh, before I ask my last question, where can people learn more about you and your work? I am primarily active on X, where I post a lot about research. I post some stuff on my personal life. Um, any content that I create goes on there. My username is uh, B, the letter B underscore Holmer, H-O-L-M-E-R. Um, and other than that, I, uh, post most of my content on Substack. Um, it, the Substack is called physiologically speaking, and you can just go to physiologically speaking.com and that will take you to my Substack. I do a weekly newsletter on there where I post about often, you know, things like VO2 max, what we were talking about today, but any study that I read during the week that I find is kind of impactful, it might relate to diet. It might relate to nutrition, it might relate to exercise or heart health, sleep. Um, I summarize that. It's a fairly lengthy, not too long, but you know, it's a it's a good breakdown of the study, some background. And so I post on there at least once a week. Sometimes I post more, but yeah, that's that's mainly where people can find me. Subscribe to my newsletter and you know you'll you'll get anything I post on there. I won't spam you too much though. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Sounds good. And uh, my last question is um What's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Yeah, I, it's funny. I was asked this on another podcast, and I think that my uh, my answer probably wasn't what most people would expect, but it was walking. Um, I like recently have only started to walk for the sake of just walking, probably in the last like 
four to five years. Um, but I have just found that not necessarily for improving my fitness. Um, but I just think that it's a way to reduce how much time I'm sitting, which I think is good, even though I'm very physically active, do a lot of exercise during the week, sitting less is beneficial, I think for everyone. Um, but it's also just, I think a way to, to kind of de-stress, listen to an audiobook, listen to a podcast, get outside, get sun. Um, it's, provided immense benefits just to my life overall, even with helping recovery from exercise. So I try to walk for at least an hour a day in addition to whatever exercise I'm doing. And I just wish I would have discovered it earlier. I mean, when I was younger, you know, in my twenties and things like that, I just, I never thought about the idea of like going for a walk. It was always just, eh, I'd rather just like stay inside and sit on the couch. But uh, now I really do try to be deliberate about walks I try to walk after like every meal. I found that to be kind of beneficial just for promoting digestion, blood glucose, and things like that. So that's just a habit that I've adopted uh, recently that I um, am very happy I did. Mm. Yeah, that's very uh, good advice. I yeah, like think as well that walking is pretty underrated, and uh, certainly you're not gonna like increase your VO two max with it. At least most people won't. But uh, yeah, you're just getting this low intensity and uh, low uh, like uh, impact uh, movement as well that we uh, just you know need pretty much as much as we we can uh, fit into our day yeah definitely i mean i think we uh i think we kind of evolved not necessarily to exercise like we do but to just walk a lot a ton of low intensity activity i mean if you look at the studies from the anthropologists and the people studying you know the whether it's hunter gatherer cultures or even like you know chimpanzees they just do a lot of maybe not chimpanzees, they kind of sit all day, but hunter gatherer populations are just walking, doing low intensity activity all day long. You know, they're not sitting a ton. So I think that's what our body likes to do. Exercise is obviously great for us, but um, just doing as much walking and all that low intensity activity is, is great, not just for the body, but I think uh, for the brain too, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, great talking with you and yeah, super interesting for me. And I think the listeners as well are going to enjoy everything about the VHMX. max Yeah, I hope so. And uh, I appreciate you having me on the podcast team. I, uh, I enjoy your content a lot. You know, I think I started following you on Twitter, but, um, you know, your YouTube is great. I think you're spreading a lot of interesting information. And so I uh, appreciate you having me on as a guest. Yeah, I will. I'll see you around. Great. Sounds good. All right, that's it for this episode. If you liked it, then make sure you subscribe and follow us on social media. You can also pre-order my new book, The Longevity Leap, at thelongevityleap.com.